Okay. All righty. There we go. Sorry about that. All right. So, yeah, I usually kind of start at the start of when you started playing and, and um, you know, what your first instrument of choice was or what's the first thing you picked up and started playing kind of thing. Uh, well, I think I was uh, about two. Oh, wow. I got a guitar for Christmas. She's 14 years older than I am. Um, and uh, I got a little plastic Mickey Mouse guitar with a little crank on it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> she got a real guitar, and I wanted it. And I wanted it so bad that she had to hide it after she opened it. I threw a fit, and I would steal it from her at every opportunity. And so she had to take to hiding it and locking it in the closet to keep it away from me. And then I kind of forgot about guitar. Um, and then when I was uh, uh, eight, um, I had been taking uh, piano lessons, and I wanted a guitar. And uh, my mom got me a little uh, three-quarter size student classical guitar. I, I actually still got it. It's, it's hanging on my wall downstairs. It was. Uh, oh wow. I think it was about twelve dollars, you know, which was really cheap. But uh, anyway, uh, I still didn't really take it very seriously. And then uh, on September eighteenth, nineteen seventy, I was I was uh, watching the uh, evening news with my parents. I was eleven years old, and uh, they announced that Jimi Hendrix had died. Uh -huh. Yeah. And they showed him playing uh, the National Anthem at Woodstock, and I, I went bananas. And my parents were uh, uh, very, very uh, square and very uh, old for parents. I mean, my mom didn't have me until she was like 39. Uh -huh. uh, went nuts, too. They, they thought it was just the worst thing that they'd ever seen. And that seeing that reaction, for some reason, I guess I'm kind of naturally a rebel, but... Uh, <laughs> just said, oh, yeah, I want to do that. And I became completely obsessed with the guitar at that point. They did not want me to to have an electric guitar. For them, it was uh, it was a political symbol you know, oh. um, that they reacted really strongly to in a negative sense. <coughs> I said, absolutely not. I said, fine, I'll, I'll buy it myself. And... Uh, um, I got 50 cents a night to clear the table and uh, uh, rinse the dishes and put them in the dishwasher and clean up after dinner was my allowance at that time. And so I, I saved my allowance, and they didn't think that I would stick it out, but I did. I saved my money, and I bought a really cheap little electric guitar and an even cheaper little amp. <laughs> and uh, that was the beginning of... Uh, uh, Total obsession. I, I even skipped school to play guitar. I practiced probably 12 hours a day. Oh wow! So what that's was? The oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, that's the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, what what was your first band? Did you get into bands early on, or did you right away almost? Uh, okay. I put together I put together a band uh, when I was uh, 12. It was called Wizard. And um, actually played played a gig, played an end of end of school dance um, with this band. And uh, my cousin was a really uh, good musician who was also a band leader. Mm. And uh, I roped him into playing bass for us and loaning me all of their amplifiers and stuff. You know, <laughs> was he older than you, or? Yeah, yeah, he's. Uh, uh, about uh, oh, I think he's about nine years older than I am. Oh, so he was quite a bit older then at that time. Yeah, yeah. So he's already probably out of high school and. Yeah, I made the poor guy get up on stage with a bunch of little kids, man. <laughs> forever for that, though. <laughs> Interesting. What? Well, so was he sort of the leader, or? Uh... Yeah, he was. He was a. Uh, uh, he was a horn player who also played uh, guitar, bass, and keyboards. He was a multi-instrumentalist, wow. but he was a band leader. He had a band uh, called West Coast Brass, and uh, I think there were 11 pieces, um, full horn section, and they 
they toured uh, the United States doing covers of uh, Chicago and Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Oh, yeah, yeah. And funk and just the stuff that was just really big in the 70s. And they were a great band. And this was sort of also the other uh, start of my my uh, obsession with music was that for a year, my, my folks rented a house from my aunt and uncle. And his band, West Coast Brass, uh, rehearsed in this big multi-car garage at that house. And I would come home. I was a latchkey kid. And I would come home to this 11-piece uh, band wailing in the garage after school. You know, it was oh. really amazing. I'd, I'd sit in and listen to them, you know? Interesting. What was his name? My cousin's name was Rick Batdorf. Interesting. They were actually a, a, a top Northwest band back in the 70s. Yeah, it seems like I've heard the name. It wasn't in my focus as far as this book, but I probably ran across it on the Pacific Northwest uh, website or something like that, I imagine. They very well might have. They were well known back in the day. Interesting. Yeah, that was actually, my dad was a big fan of um, classical music and jazz, and so the only rock and roll records he had um, when I was just kind of forming musical tastes, and, uh, you know, the first band I liked was Kiss, actually, <laughs> that I saw in concert, but he had Chicago and Blood, Sweat, and Tears and, and things like that around the house, and I remember liking some of that, too, growing up. Yeah, I still like that stuff. So, yeah, so it sounds like you started out pretty early. Did How long did Wizard last? Oh, jeez. Uh, I've, I've actually got to try to remember this. <laughs> well, it lasted, it lasted long enough um, to practice outside in the backyard a few times and draw a crowd and then the police and then to play this after-school dance. And I don't really remember what happened to it after that. So did you um, go on to uh, play in another band immediately, or did it, was it a while before you got something together again? Or? Boy, you're really jogging my memory here. <laughs> yeah, making you dig there. Uh. Far back a long time. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to have to kind of go on generalities here. Um, uh, I, just, I just really uh, immersed myself in... in guitar and I had all, all my friends were like 10 years older than I was and I would hang I would hang out with guys in college and play guitar with them you know and, um, and you were in like junior high or high school at that point or junior high yeah wow. um, and uh, you know, I played my first I played my first gig in a bar when I was 15 by lying about my age you know um, but uh, I, I grew up in a college town, and, and uh, um, I hung out with a lot of music majors, you know? Where, where did you grow up at? Bellingham. Oh, you're at Bellingham. Mm -hmm. So you're a little further north. And... So did you, when did you migrate down to Seattle then, or did you stay up there? I left home when I was 18, and I, I actually uh, went on the road with a band for a year that was based out of Wenatchee, um, and it was a it was a, a heavy metal cover band uh, that did a lot of uh, a lot of uh, colleges and uh, a lot of like uh, outdoor concerts and whatnot. We were quite well paid and uh, <coughs> for for the time, and uh, I did that for a year, and then uh, uh, I came to Seattle in uh, nineteen. What was the name of the band in Wenatchee? Do you remember? Hard Luck. Hard Luck. So you guys mostly played up and around that area and that sort of thing, it sounds like, then? Or did you guys play all around? Uh, we played, jeez, uh, we, we pretty much played the whole Pacific Northwest, you know. I okay, know, so you guys did kind of uh, the circuit and so forth? Yeah. But it was like, it did a lot of college gigs, you know. So then you said you moved to Seattle in 1980, then. Did 
Did I lose you, or are you still there? Uh, no, I'm here. Oh, okay. I, I said, uh-huh. Oh, okay. So did you get involved in any of the Battle of the Bands there in, in Bellevue and that sort of thing that was going on around that time? Or Well, the band that I was in in, in Wenatchee, um, we actually won the Northwest Battle of the Bands. And uh, uh, we, won, we won recording time in a studio. And uh, we didn't actually have any original music, so we went in and we did cover songs in the studio. You know, we were a heavy metal cover band. We were young, but... Uh, um, no, not after I not after I came uh, over here to Seattle. So you guys actually won it before you. <laughs> huh? I said so you actually won the, one of those before you actually moved, sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, when I came to Seattle, I didn't want to play cover music anymore. I see. So did you stick with those guys for a while longer, or did you end up moving on to something else, or? Oh, what the the, the cover band? Yeah. No, oh, I I. I left Wenatchee and moved to Seattle in 1980, and I started working on my own music. I see. So when did you hook up with the guys with Fifth Angel? Um, well, I I knew them. Um, I, I met them uh, pretty much right away when I came to Seattle, uh, I think maybe in 81. Um, they were in another band. Uh, some of them were in another band. And then um, I ended up moving down to uh, I ended up moving down to LA. I think in in, in uh, mid 1981, and I was there for a year. And then I came back, and uh, I came back with the plan uh, in my mind to get a hold of uh, uh, the vocalist, which was Ted Pilot, and the drummer, and to put together a band. I see. And so I came back from L.A., and that's what I did. So the uh, what uh, kind of focused you going down to L.A. or or directed you towards what you wanted to do with with trying to well, put something I, I together? Well, I joined a, I had joined another band um, that, that that was a cover band when I first came to Seattle, and I went on the road with them, and they were a. a Interestingly enough, they were a band with a full horn section. They were actually based out of out of Las Vegas, uh, and they 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 were like a, a high production value show band. Hmm. Um, and uh, they went they filed for bankruptcy um, shortly after I joined them, and and uh, broke up. And I I followed um, I followed the vocalist um, and. Uh, I followed the vocalist and one other guy. I'm trying to remember who it was, but but anyway, uh, they went to LA. They invited me down. I ended up going there uh, with a brown paper bag and a guitar and, and <laughs> being on a sofa. You know, that's how I got my start in LA. Um, so that's that's how I ended up moving to LA. And then uh, you know, I did the usual shit down there. Um, played the usual places. You know, the Troubadour. Uh, Perkins Palace, um, and uh, decided I needed to come back here and, and uh, put together this vision I had, which became Fifth Angel. Hmm. I modeled uh, I modeled the idea basically um, after what I had seen Queensryche do, mm -hmm. which was rather than expending my energy um, uh, playing gigs and trying to get record executives out to see the band. Um, to hold up and to self-finance a uh, a fully produced album and then to shop it. That was that was my big plan. Yeah. And that wasn't a common plan in nineteen uh, in nineteen eighty two. You know, very few people were were thinking along those lines. Everybody wanted to you know to get noticed playing live and mm -hmm. it had my fill of it in all of these cover bands. And, I also had, uh, uh, before this, I had done uh, an original band of my own that was called 2XS. This was before I uh, went to L.A. It was my, my original band here. And we played some shows, and, and uh, uh, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to play my music, you know. Mm -hmm. 
kind of hard to get noticed when everybody's, for one, there's nobody to notice you <laughs> at that time, and, and also everybody's playing the same cover songs and stuff, so it's just not really, you know, I know Queensryche, you know, did, like you said, that you modeled somewhat after them of doing a demo and and then shopping it over to the, you know, in their case, they shopped it to the UK and as well as record labels and got noticed over there first, and so, you know, in essence, sending it out somewhere else. <laughs> So uh, yeah, that that's understandable certainly. So when did you guys actually record the the album that eventually Shrapnel picked up? Well, it's interesting because um, that album has got more lives than a cat. But it, it was actually recorded um, on, on in two sections on at two different times. Um, Half of the album was recorded uh, in, uh, between 1983 and 1984, and the other half of the album was recorded between 1984 and 1985. Hmm. And uh, we went in and self-financed uh, a four-song EP um, at Steve Lost Productions, and Terry Date at the time was uh, uh, a a second engineer and, and gopher down there. You know, he wasn't uh, the well-known producer that he is today. Yeah, he was. Uh, we got a real good deal on studio time after hours. Um, oh, interesting. And uh, we recorded these these four songs and mixed them, and, and uh, we put together. Uh, God, he must have put together over 150 uh, promo packages with everything that goes into a promo package uh, and sent them out to management and labels and every, everybody in the known universe. <coughs> and uh, uh, we got immediate interest from uh, Shrapnel Records because of the guitar playing. And uh, so they ended up uh, paying for five more songs to be recorded and mixed. I see. Make it a full oh, album. Yeah, it was the album is made up of of uh, the album is made up of of songs that were recorded as as an EP and then shopped and then uh, uh, the label stepped in and financed finishing it with the rest of the songs. So and then now eventually it it got you get. The band got picked up by Epic, and they reissued that album. But you were you already gone at that point, or it happened at exactly the same time? <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, it was a it was a it was a real nasty situation. Um, uh, literally, um, uh, the last time that I saw those guys, I was uh, I was signing the recording agreements, and then. Uh, uh, about after about two weeks of them uh, uh, saying that they uh, uh, that they had other things going on and didn't want to rehearse while they were actually auditioning people to take my place, uh, I got a note from management, um, and this was about money, and it was about a partnership agreement that they mm. that they, they didn't want to honor once we got the deal, and they went behind my back. And they uh, they actually enlisted the band attorney in uh, drafting a new partnership agreement that relinquished the rights that I had, which was a complete violation of every legal ethic known to man. You know. Wow. So uh, that rather pissed me off, but I immediately put together my own band and uh, went back to Shrapnel Records with uh, James Bird's Atlantis Rising. Yeah, it was interesting. It's a good album. <laughs> and situation ever again. Oh, that's too bad. It's unfortunate how money, unfortunately. Yeah, money uh, really fucks things up, man. So, um, yeah, Atlantis Rising, pretty, always been a favorite album of mine as well. Um, so you had Evan Sheely on, played a bass on that. Um, and, uh, Freddie Crewman's 
Uh, and Mary. Yeah, so Ken was really like almost like a studio guy that kind of jumped around on all sorts of different things. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, he's the guy's played on a bazillion records. Um, he was he was uh, touring with Alice Cooper when he was in when he was in Fifth Angel with us. You know, we used to get uh, uh, other drivers to fill in for him for rehearsals while he was while he was on the road. You know. <laughs> wow. So, do you guys ever actually play around the shows around after the Shrapnel release came out at first? No, or? we we did not. We did not. Was the so? You, did you get offers, or you just guys decided not to do it, or? Well, I don't know what happened with them after after I left the band uh, after the signing with with Epic Records. I don't know what kind of offers they got, but I assume that they that they did get offers. You know, that was our our goal was to to to, to do a national tour with tour support. Yeah. Um. And uh, but they. For some, for whatever reason, they didn't they didn't do that after I left. Hmm. I don't know why, but I think there was something about by the time that the the second record came out, like a year later after they reissued the one that you played on, they the label dropped them or something like that, so they couldn't even tour around it or whatever. Wow. Like a pretty I honestly don't know crazy because those two albums are still like a lot of people's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the, the, they've reissued that first album now no less than five times. Oh, wow. Uh, it's in Sony's Classics catalog. Yeah, it's it's a good album. So, uh, interesting. So so how did you, so I know Freddie Crewmans was from Phoenix, was a band. I actually interviewed yeah. Phil C., that was the keyboard player for that band, and also Open Fire, that uh, was a band before that he had. Um, and then... Evan, I've interviewed as well. You know, from played with TKO and Q5 and all kinds of different things too. So how did you hook up with those guys? Um, well, I, I found Freddie through um, uh, an ad in the Rocket. <laughs> believe it or not, and uh, they sent me a tape, and uh, we got together, and you know, things clicked right away. So now you did you did another album or two with Shrapnel after after the first solo album you did Atlantis Rising didn't you? Yeah, I did. Uh, I did uh, I did Atlantis Rising. Then I did my first instrumental album, which was Octoglomerate. Then I did my second instrumental album, which was Son of Man. And then I did a vocal album with uh, Robert Mason from Lynch Mob that was uh, called The Apocalypse Chime. And then I, I, it took me a long time to get out of my shrapnel contract, uh, um, but I, I did. And uh, with uh, fulfilling the contract with the Apocalypse Chime, I then uh, I got myself a manager, and I went to Japan uh, with with a new self-financed album, which uh, was Crimes Virtuosity, and I landed a, a major deal over there on JBC. So you're also playing shows over there as well and that sort of thing? Or? <laughs> I had tour support in my in my contract, and when the album came out in Japan, um, that was when the entire Japanese stock market tanked. <laughs> oh, no. The label pulled tour support, and I guess there was some kind of a big industry meeting or something between the labels as a matter of national policy, but Japan used to be um, an 80% import music market, 20% domestic, and the decision was apparently made by all of the major labels over in Japan that that figure needed to be flipped around, so it was 80% mm. domestic, 20% import. Um, so JBC did not honor their tour commitment with me, so the tour didn't happen. No, oh, boy. Now, how did the how did the record do over there? How did the the album? Uh, the... I think it, I think it did pretty well. Um, I'm trying to remember. Um, it, it it did chart. I'm trying to remember where it charted. Um, 
was on the uh, Masa Ito Radio Hour. I don't know if you know who he is. It seems like I've heard the name before. I think he's had Malmsteen and a bunch of different people on there. Like the big metal guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it did well. I uh, also ended up uh, doing a deal with Mascot Records in Europe, um, and uh, I remixed the album and remastered it uh, for them and gave them uh, gave them a bonus track. Nice. So you, it sounds like you had a pretty good following over in Europe and Japan, then. Yeah, I think that's I think that's probably most of my following. Hmm. Yeah, I know. When even when sort of grunge and that sort of thing hit, killed a lot. <laughs> it killed a lot of bands' careers and that sort of thing here in the U.S. So a lot of them, like I know Malmsteen, a lot of those guys were still touring and playing in Japan, and you know, had still had a big following and kept that over the years over there. You know, nothing ever really changed in Europe or or Japan as far as the following of heavy metal. So. Yeah, especially guitar players. They always seem to embrace yeah. the virtuoso type players. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, we used to rehearse next next door to Alice and Chains down uh, at the bank back in the early '90s with Atlantis Rising. Well, so you guys were right there, and in, 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 you were at Sound Bank rehearsing too, or huh? You were at the Sound Bank itself rehearsing, or Music Bank? Music Bank, sorry, yeah, that's where we rehearsed. Yeah, oh, interesting. They just had a bunch of rooms that you could practice in, sort of thing, or yeah, we rented their biggest room for quite a while down there. That's where that's actually where we recorded. Uh, uh, well, I actually released the demo recordings a couple of years ago that we re- recorded down there at the Music Bank. We had a 16-track studio down there. Hmm. Interesting. Are those so? Those are available on CD or something somewhere? Oh uh, yeah, I released the album as, as it's called uh, uh, Beyond the Pillars, uh, Last Rise Beyond the Pillars. And I, I released it uh, a couple of years ago on, on my European label. Yeah, that stuff was recorded like in 1988, 89. I'd be interested in picking that up myself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's got a lot of the same songs that were on the first Atlantis Rising album. Um, they're the demos uh, that we did before we went in and, and made that album. Uh, and there's some uh, there's some songs that aren't on that album, and then there are versions of those same songs. Interesting. Mm. So I guess. Uh, um, probably ask what you're up to these days and that sort of thing. Um, well, I, I, I went on after uh, the JVC thing and I, I signed with a label in Europe called Lion Music and uh, produced a couple of uh, self-titled albums with them and then I, I played on a bunch of tribute albums. Um, and in the uh, uh, 19... in the... Uh, Mid late 1990s, I, I I started designing a guitar that I ended up uh, I ended up getting uh, four national uh, patents and trademarks on and going into production, and I produce guitars today. Hmm, interesting. What's the what's the line called? Um, well, it's my my company is is uh, Bird Musical Instruments, and the guitars uh, the patented guitars are called the Super Aviati. And uh, you can see them on birdguitars.com. Is there, um, is it just a specific design that you came up with, or is there a certain type of electronics in it that's different, or? Uh, it's it's uh, it's a it's a it's a completely unique ergonomic design. Um, hmm. Doesn't look like like anything you've seen before. It's it, it's it's sort of a hybrid between a flying V and a Stratocaster, but it's its own thing. Oh, huh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. There's a few guys have definitely shifted into either coming up with some um, 
some uh, technology or or something to that effect on on guitars or did, worked uh, you know Evan of course started Bass Northwest and had his own store up there and so forth too. And I, well, I I have a 35 year professional career in automotive fabrication. Oh, interesting. And so um, it, it was kind of a tie-in because uh, I've done a lot of a lot of custom work and a lot of design for a lot of people for a long, long time. And uh, I just decided one day that uh, that I. I I thought I could build a better mousetrap, hmm. so that's that's what I do now. Interesting. So we'll apply some of that knowledge. So you worked in the, doing automotive uh, stuff all the time. You were playing music as well, or most of the time, yeah. Huh. Yeah, uh, was a uh, custom metal shaper, fabricator, precision welder. Oh wow! Designer did a lot of uh, did a lot of million dollar cars. Um, had. Uh, my work's been, uh, well, let's see, I took second place uh, at Pebble Beach with a 1935 Lancia Fiat Torpedo. Um, I did the metal work on the, the car that was voted best Packard in America on the National Packard Convention in 1938. Oh, wow. It's a 1935 Dietrich Packard. Oh, wow. Um, I've done a lot of Ferraris and Rolls Royces. I've also done a lot of hot rod stuff. Nice. Cool. That's interesting. So, well, I don't, I don't know if I have any other questions. I mean, other than, uh, I don't know if I guess if you um, reflected on your impact on uh, the Seattle music scene or your or heavy metal in general, or what your thoughts might be looking back on it or whatever. I'm just surprised that so many people. Um that, that that Fifth Angel has such a such a following, and so many people know me. It just surprises me. It never <laughs> fails to surprise me. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I, you're an excellent guitar player. I've definitely always been a fan of your work as well. So Thank you. you're welcome. Yeah, it's it's. I, I think sometimes we don't realize how much of an impact we make on people, or or how many people can know about some things. So, yeah. Well, cool. Well, um, I guess that's all I have, really. I think that pretty much covered it. Um, okay, very good. Um, yeah, I mean, if I, uh, you know, I'll, I'll definitely drop you a line if I think of anything else that I forgot to ask you. Or, um, okay, James. And and I'll keep you in the loop, of course. And, of course, I will make sure you get a copy of the book when it's out. And um, Cool. Yeah, I guess I'll find out what it, what it gets called. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I'm still kicking around a couple of days, so I'm not quite sure what. But, uh yeah, I was kind of thinking of something to to kind of tie into the Northwest. Just instead of, yeah, I don't want a boring title of Northwest Heavy Metal and Hard Rock or something. That could be a subtitle, but um, kind of sort of have something catchy, I think. But but yeah, no, I think you'll find it pretty interesting. It's going to be a bigger size book. I want to do with it with a lot of images. I have a lot of materials for it already. Coffee table book. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah, cool. I think it just doesn't do it justice when you have these little, you know, paperbacks with a few little black and white pictures in them and this sort of thing. And um, I, I'm also putting, besides the history and, and band biographies and interviews, I've got a discography. And so I'll have pictures of, of, you know, CDs and albums and things like that in there and posters. And a lot of people have sent me photos and things. And I'm working with a couple guys that actually were professional photographers that took shots back in the days and, so, so yeah, it should be pretty interesting. And a lot of interviews so far. I've gotten a really good response about it. And I, I've got, uh, you know, even the people that I railed off to you, I've already got a few more people in the can. And a lot of those guys have either finished interviews or they're working on questions right now or, or at least said they were going to do it. So, uh, so, yeah. So I'm just trying to get everybody I can get that, you know, and, and fill in all the blanks and, and try to do it justice. So. Right, right. So. All right. Well, cool. Well, thanks, James. I appreciate your time. And no hey, problem, James. Like I said, I'll definitely keep you in the loop on it. All right, my friend. All right. Take care. I'll see you in the funny papers and on Facebook then. Sounds good. Take right. care. Ciao.